Our presenter is Logigear CTO Hans Boalda. Hans is going to be sharing his knowledge to help you get the most from your test automation. So with that, Hans, I think we're ready for you to start. Okay, uh, thank you, Joe. I hope you can all hear me all right. Uh, I don't see you, but I uh, see a counter here, so I know that you're there. Uh, we're going to talk about test automation a bit, and especially focusing on what the tests should look like to be good for automation. So with that, let's take a look at the agenda. Uh, it looks like a long agenda, but uh, many of these items will only be a few uh, slides. Now, we're, we'll try to do this within about 15 minutes or so. That also means I cannot go to, uh, to great depth on each of these topics. But if you have particular questions, maybe technical questions or process questions or anything, just uh, drop me an email. Uh, Hans at logicgear.com or Hans at happytester.com uh, and I will be happy to discuss these things in much more depth than I can do today. On the Happy Tester site you can also find my uh, articles so you can read more about what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to start with what makes automated testing different. I will talk about some of the domain language approaches that are becoming very popular both uh, keywords and uh, BDD. Uh, I will talk about a method called action-based testing, which is kind of the core of this uh, presentation. And then we move into what, uh, what is important in test design, specifically meant to smooth automation. I will give you uh, an example what you could use as a template for your test design. And but of course you can also do your own test design in any other way. Uh, what I also added is a slide with anti-patterns, things that you should look out for if you see that in your test and uh, you might want to rethink your, uh, your approach. And we'll talk a bit about actions and their arguments. Then we go to more the team side of it. What can the developers do for you to make automation more smooth? and how would this fit into an agile uh, process. So first let's talk a little bit about uh, testing. Now I'm aware that I'm simplifying our testing world enormously with this slide, but it gives kind of a good idea what you're up against. Uh, on one side of the spectrum you have the unit testing, which is really close to the code. Usually it is testing individual methods of classes, uh, or uh, maybe API calls of components, but it is very closely related to uh, the code. That means it's very, very scalable. Uh, I, I like to call it the king of scalability. When the code grows, your unit test grows, uh, it's, it's quite easy to know when you check in or check out the file which test you need to run. And if there is a problem either with the, the system under test or with the test, you will know it quickly. On the other edge of the spectrum, is uh, exploratory testing at the bottom of the uh, matrix. That is a very effective technique to do testing. It, it works really well. You find uh, bugs you cannot believe, but it is very human driven. It is not necessarily automated. You can automate it afterwards, but that is not uh, what it is meant to do. Now in the middle, and that's what I probably, uh, that's what I will talk about most, is functional testing. So that means you, you test the functionality of the system under test, uh, either the whole system at once or at least parts, large parts of the system at once. Uh, and that's where all the functions of the system come together. And you want to automate those. Most of the teams, most of the projects want to automate those. But that can be a bottleneck and that's what we will talk about. First let's look at an uh, automated test. When you look at this test, which is written in uh, Coded UI, uh, Coded UI for Microsoft is a really advanced automation standard. Uh, it has many features, it is very strong, it's really state of the art. But when you look at this screen, you immediately know, hey, what am I testing here? It is difficult to understand even though uh, uh, it technically it's very savvy, but especially if you're not technical, if, you don't, if you're not fluent in uh, C-sharp, uh, you will have a hard time understanding what am I testing here. And that means you kind of rule out 
a whole category of uh, people like uh, domain experts and non-technical people uh, in your process. So what you see coming up is domain, what I would like to call domain language approaches, where you express your test in a non-technical manner and in a more uh, uh, ubiquitous way, so that it is available not only to the testers, but to the developers, the stakeholders, uh, uh, everybody. <coughs> and what you can also try to do is by standardizing the, the, the st sentences and the statements you have for that language, you can base your automation on that. So rather than automating the tests, you're kind of automating the components of the language. And the, the two main examples that I'm aware of is the keywords, and particularly the, the keyword-based actions, like in uh, action-based testing, and uh, the natural language scenarios, like in uh, BDD, which is, the, is getting very popular uh, right now. Let's look at those actions first. What you do in a keyword test like this, you take it out of the tool, so it is in like a spreadsheet format, and we, we actually have a tool for this test development tool called uh, Test Architect, and where my examples will uh, come from. But what you do is you read the test from top to bottom. So the first action is open an account with 123123 as the number, and John Doe is the account holder. Then we deposit $10.11. Uh, then we deposit $20.22. So now we check the balance. And for that account, the balance should be $30.33. Um, that $30.33, we call that an expected value. So you still have to execute the test uh, to see what's the actual value. Now, what you, what you notice here is this test is quite understandable. It's about accounts and deposit and check balance. But I have not even shown you the system under test. It could be web-based, it could be uh, client-server, it could be an old-fashioned mainframe. From the test, you cannot even tell. And that is very useful. It means you focus the test on the business functionality. And regardless what your technology is to implement that business functionality, this test will always be valid. And obviously what you can do if there is a change in your system under test, let's say, text boxes become drop-down menus or something like that, you can just adapt those single actions. You do not have to go back to your tests. And so uh, here are some refinements to this method. Have, this is a refinement where I keep the quantity of cars that I have, the quantity of Chevy volts. I store that in a variable, which I name volts. Then I rent a car. Then I rent another car, and now I should have uh, two less volts left. So uh, that's, that's our convention. Whenever you see a pound sign, that means this is a formula. This value should not be taken literally. Uh, it's a formula. In this case, the original amount minus two. The techniques like that make your test less dependent on preconditions. Obviously, you still need to have enough volts, at least two, to run this test, but you don't have to know that number in advance. Another thing that is very popular is that you take those uh, tests, that you take those actions and uh, use them to create new actions. So in this case, we check and, uh, create a new action called check balance. And what is that going to do? It has two arguments, customer and amount. And so we're going to enter the last name of the customer, we click a button, uh, view balance, and then we check the balance against that other argument. Once you have created an action, you can start using that in your spreadsheet over and over and over again. Here is another application of actions where you use it for data-driven testing. So I have a test which takes a car, it keeps the quantity, then it rents that particular car, and then it checks that quantity. And which cars and which customers are actually used comes from a data set, where you can see that that car here uh, is a column header, which comes back as a variable in that uh, data-driven test. And so you see use data sets to start the loop, 
and then repeat the data set will take the next row. So uh, you can filter that and all that, but that is an uh, easy to do technique. Uh, like uh, everything I'm showing today will be uh, technically not hard uh, to, uh, to do this. Another uh, technique is if you want to do multi-station testing. That means you have multiple test machines running against the same system under test. For example, one uh, machine uh, mimics a bank teller and a bank teller wants to uh, withdraw $10,000 from an account, but then the supervisor, which is on another machine, needs to approve that. So with that use deputy means the other machine gets the control, will do the approval, whatever that is, press a button or something like that, and then go back to the lead machine, which is mimicking the banking teller. So there are many more of these techniques, but these are kind of the most important techniques for action-based testing. Now let's take a look at behavior-driven development. Many of you are probably familiar with that. I have written about it about uh, two months ago on the TechWell uh, site, which uh, is an article which you might like. Um, what you do in uh, business, uh, behavior driven development is that you make scenarios and those are called GWT, given when then. So it's a very strict format, but it is very natural language, makes it very readable. I took this example actually from Wikipedia. You can look it up uh, after this uh, webinar. Given a customer pre previously bought a black sweater for me and I currently have three left in stock, but then when he returns it, I should have four black sweaters in stock. Now, that is easy to understand. It's easy to understand for a domain expert, an end user. Uh, developers can use this to develop their systems. And you could automate it. There is a tool. There are a couple of tools. There is JBehave, Cucumber, Specflow, uh, Robot Framework accepts these sentences. Uh, there is a bunch of tools that can understand these sentences and then map it to technical uh, functions like in C-sharp or in Java or in Ruby or Python and then uh, execute these tests. And so what you do is uh, black sweater, that are the arguments, uh, and free black sweaters, that are free arguments, and then you return that vision. Now, what you can also do, which, uh, which we like to do, is to combine those techniques. So you use the GWT for the natural language, but then uh, you implement that with actions. And the actions allow you, even though they're still very readable for domain experts, they allow you a bit more flexibility to, for example, keep the name of the client, get the stock, uh, return the article, and uh, look how many sweaters you have. So you can detail out the actual flow of that particular scenario to make it very quickly to implement. And then you can focus the rest of your attention just on those actions to make a smooth uh, test. Another way, which I recently have been uh, doing, is to actually convert. So here you see the sentences again. And what that little converter tool does, it will convert those sentences into actions. To do that, you need to map those uh, actions to sentences. So for each action and arguments, you will find uh, one or more sentences where the arguments are uh, between curly brackets. And, uh, and then this tool is able to translate either from the scenario to the actions or from the actions back to the scenario. And uh, for the fun of it, the tool will also take care of uh, plurals and singulars and translating the word free into the digit free, stuff like that. Uh, if you're interested in that tool, send me an email. I, uh, I'll give it to you for you for free and you can use it with Test Architect, but you can also use it with any other tool out there. So I'm happy to share it with you. And those those arguments, this tool is based on regular expressions, so rather than the curly brackets, you can also put in your own regular expressions. Okay, that is enough about uh, the domain language approaches. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the test design. Uh, 
So when you have that approach, you still need to think about how you test. And that is for two reasons. First reason is obviously the quality and the manageability of the test. And you see a lot of tests uh, in companies is very like lame, very mechanical. There's not really much going on. Uh, it, uh, most tests are quite boring, especially automated tests, uh, which I feel is not really necessary. But the other re major reason uh, to have a good test design is for your automation. It turns out that it is very difficult to automate badly designed tests. You really need to focus your test design on the fact that you're going to automate, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about. And that you see my, my statement there at the bottom of the slide. I really believe that successful automation is not a technical challenge. It is a test design challenge. And that's kind of a problem. That means that it is your testers and you testers who define how maintainable your, uh, your automation is going to be. And that's why we call this webinar garbage in, garbage out. If as a tester you come up with too many details and too convoluted test cases, your automation engineer, your friendly automation engineer, cannot fix that. And this is kind of an illustration. Here we go back about 120 years ago when the first cars came around. They looked like carriages, except we took away the horse. So we replaced the horse with a motor, and but the design of the carriage stays the same. And if you don't believe me, here you can see it. These are some very early cars, and they really look like carriages without a horse. Uh, so that was the early period. This, by the way, the one on the top left, is a Porsche, just in case you uh, wonder. Now, nowadays, cars look a lot different. The mere fact that we have a motor means we redefined the entire design of the car. And this is my car, a Chevy Volt, and you see there is no room for horses, and nobody is sitting on the roof even though with the Bay Area traffic, that could be a handy thing to do. So, what, what it shows is automation is only the motor, but the fact that you have automation means that the rest of the design of your test needs to be adapted to be more streamlined to fit the motor. So, this is how we do that. We call that action-based testing. And what we're doing here is we organize the test in something we call test modules, where each test module starts with a bunch of objectives and then a bunch of test cases. And then all of those test cases are using those actions, and those action keywords I was talking about, which is the basis for your automation. Now when you look at the bottom of this picture, you see that you can have very different tests. On the bottom left, you have something which I like to call an interaction test, uh, which is uh, I'm entering something in the username field, then I enter something in the password field. That means that the OK button should be enabled, and that the OK button enabled property should be true. Uh, and that's a good test, but it is a low-level test. You should not do that every time you log in. On the bottom right, you see what I like to call a business test. So I log in yeah, as J. Doe. Password is car guy, doesn't really matter. Then I enter a rental, and that is Mary Renter is going to uh, uh, rent in Fort Escape, and then I check the bill. And so on the bottom right, you don't see any uh, what we call low level actions. You don't see any interaction. It's not about enter, it's not about uh, click or anything like that. So the message is not that business tests are better than interaction tests, far from it, but the message is you need to keep those separated. So you should have modules uh, for interaction tests and you should have modules for business tests. And to summarize that, I like to talk about what I call the three holy grails of test design. And the first grail is that effective breakdown of the test into test modules. And most of all, that each test module is a very clear and differentiated scope. So it's different from any other test module. Then for each test module, you need to think your approach, which test design technique, who the stakeholders are, how uh, are you going to do it in a sprint or not, that kind of questions. And then once you start developing the test, now you need to figure out 
what actions am I going to use? Is it interaction? That means I use low level actions. Is it a business test? That means I'm going to use high level actions. And also, what checks are you going to do? Are you not going to do uh, a check enabled of, uh, of an OK button when you do a business test? That just doesn't make sense. So this is a slide that you might want to put on the wall when you uh, talk about test design. This is kind of the criteria that you can use. Uh, it starts with functionality. If you have customers and financial and management information and graphics and stuff like that, that should all be different test modules. Architecture is important, especially when you have a well-designed system with components and tiers and uh, services and microservices. Then you can organize your test uh, alongside to it. And of course, what kind of test? Uh, the negative test should definitely go in another test module than your positive test. And then in addition, you can look at some other environment factors, like who are the stakeholders, is the test complex or not, uh, technical aspects, if you have to, uh, to go into, uh, we, we tested the car diagnostic system, so if you go into a car for embedded software, you might want to put that in a separate test module, so that all the other tests don't have to do this burden. Uh, risk, uh, project planning, and the risk, uh, if there are high risk areas, you might want to give them special test modules. Now there are roughly two ways to do this high level test design. One is which I prefer is that you bring some people in a room. It could be a sprint team, but in, uh, it could also be, be uh, going over the teams and just a couple of uh, stakeholders, test designers and automation people and talk about it. Uh, what is the business under test? Uh, how are we going to test it? And make sure that everybody in the room is familiar with the approach. So the kind of slides that I'm showing today, and maybe you can just run the video, and uh, that people are informed about what is expected of them. But of course, you can also just do it by yourself, uh, sit behind your desk, come up with uh, an approach, a design. Even then, I would recommend to have at least two people do it together so that you uh, feed off each other and that you come up with a good test design. Because I found that doing the test design is not that easy. Even though I'm doing this since 1994, I still find it difficult when I'm confronted with a real system under test, uh, what we call a real customer. I still find it difficult to figure out how to design those tests. And don't worry, uh, later on I will give you uh, an example who you could do it, but it's something that you really need to talk about. Now, here are some examples how you could do that test design. Uh, the way I like it after many, many experiences is the first question, what are my business objects? So if I rent cars, then my business objects are the, obviously the cars, but also the locations, the customers, even the agents, the orders, all of those are business objects. Now, that is not necessarily the object in an object-oriented system design. It's more broad than that. It's more looking at the business. And then, in addition to those business objects, I like to talk about business flows. So, you, you place an order, you place another order, and then you get an invoice. That kind of sequence of events. And then there are many, many other tests like uh, specific features, like uh, the uh, premium calculator or PDF output, uh, of course administration, uh, user security, any, anything graphics, I always put that in a separate uh, test module uh, because you have to, uh, to process images which is not always easy. Uh, anything that your system has that is customizable, uh, people can make their own customizations, make other fields, you need to test that. Extensibility, interfaces with existing systems, interoperability, that kind of special test. And then within each of these categories, you always make the differentiation between interaction and business. So when you look at the picture, it will look something like this. 
And you might want to make a screenshot right now. But what it does is um, I first recognize business objects. For each business object, I'm going to make a folder. So I will have a folder cars. And, um, uh, and then within that folder, I make that uh, distinction between what I look uh, more high level test. And for a business object, that would typically be the life cycles and data operations. I put some examples there, copy and move and rename and delete, all of those, but stay at a high level. So don't detail out exactly how you delete, just delete and see if it's deleted. Then separate from that, do your interaction test. Now you really go into, let's say, new car or new order, let's take that example, new order, and there might be like 50 fields, and then you're going to check all those fields, you're going to check uh, field boundaries, you're going to check invalid values, you're going to check uh, the top order, if I use the tab key, does it really go to the next field, I check my combo boxes, all of that, and the, the, the files, the menu structure, so, and that will be many fields. And default values, uh, dependencies between faults. Uh, there are many examples. Uh, don't forget keyboard shortcuts. And and then, in addition to these, to doing that for each of the business objects, you can look at the business flows where it all comes together: transactions, uh, end-to-end testing, something I call day in the life. So you just play a whole day in the life. I have a separate technique for that, which I call soap opera testing where you compare test scenarios with soap operas on television. So you exaggerate, but it stays close to the real life, etc., etc. So, so when you do this, how do you proceed? First of all, what are the business objects? That should be your first question. I'm pretty convinced of that. Um, then for each object, what is the life cycle? How do I create it? How do I delete it? Or maybe just close it? Uh, if I have a new type of car uh, in my car uh, in my uh, my car rental company, how do I define that in my system, uh, etc. I have an example, and that example is a testing company in California. Now you can guess. Uh, once, which company I mean, but that company has services like uh, test development and automation, it has consultancy, it has training, and what I'm doing right now, it has uh, a product uh, for test development and automation, but what you see in that business process is that it is often combined, a customer might order a couple of licenses for the tool, but it might also want some training, and that customer might also have some services, and because you might have a lot of existing tests that need to be automated in a new style, so they want some services. So that means that even though it's one order, that order has many components, and the invoicing might go over multiple invoices, and the first invoice might include the product, but it might only include a little bit of the work that has been done. Then going in twice per month, you will have a new invoice with more of the work done. So you see that the business objects come together and then they split again and come together again. And so that's how you define those flows. And there is a lot of good testing in those flows. I feel that of course you have to do the, the, the life cycles and the UI and all that, but I feel that the, the, the strongest tests uh, are going to be in those flows, especially when you try to exaggerate it a little bit, so that you try some invalid values, or you try to put your network down, and destructive testing, or anything like that. And so here you see some of those examples, uh, business objects, uh, some of the flows, I uh, just made a couple of examples here. Now, we go to the next step, so we have that high level test design, now we go to in, uh, develop the individual test. In our approach we do that with something we call test modules. So each test module is like a source file, it's a unit that can be run from top to bottom. So that means that in, uh, in most of our designs the test cases are allowed to be dependent on each other. Each test case can set up 
a precondition for the next test case, and that's to encourage testers to create a flow that is more uh, more interesting than just a single test case. And so we always start with some objectives so that we know what we're going to test. Then we have an initial phase in which we set up the situation. Uh, usually it is uh, uh, start the application, log in, set some variables in a config. Then we do our test cases and then we go to a final part, maybe send an email, maybe go back to the to main screen of the application or close it down, stuff like that. Most of all, when you do this, it's important to keep your eye on the ball. So whenever you have a test module, and we do it really by the test module, always know what is the scope of that test module. You always need it, if it is not clear, go back to the first holy grail, go back to your test design, see if you can do it better. And if you need me to get involved in any of that, uh, just let me know. I'm always happy to uh, to look at your stuff uh, just uh, for free even, no problem. The scope should be clear and unambiguous. It should be clear what the scope is. Then you can use that scope to define everything else. So what are the test objectives? What kind of test cases am I going to do? Most of all, what level of actions am I going to use? And what are the checks going to be about? Uh, uh, which uh, event should generate a warning or anything like that? Now, uh, within the scope of the test module, I would like to encourage you to think out of your box. That means that you should use what I like to call an exploratory approach to your test design. So that is like exploratory testing, but exploratory testing you usually do that against a live system, but you can also do that in your test design. And I know that because I've seen people do that. You stand really stand in front of your whiteboard and you sit with a group of people and you just try to learn about the functionality under test. You try to understand it and while doing that you come up with interesting test cases. And then you come up with great tests, which are also very maintainable because they focus uh, on, on a sufficiently high level of actions. Now, take a look at this test sequence for a minute. And what I just told you, what do you feel about it? And then two questions when you see something like this. First question, is this a good test? And then the second question, remember the car and the carriage, is it good for automation? Now, uh, I don't really want to give a judgment about the test. It seems to be quite okay. Uh, there is a lot of things being tested that are apparently important. But I would not recommend a test like this to give to your automation engineer, uh, even if you translate it into actions, uh, to automate. Why? Because too many checks too many details. It is very unclear from this test what you're actually trying to do. And, uh, that, uh, you, is the account tab in focus? Is that the purpose of your test? Or actually trying to do a business test? So you should be very critical in looking at these tests. Now to show you that's not just for uh, verbose uh, scenarios like we just saw. Uh, this is a GWT test and BDD test based on a real project, I changed it a little bit so that you cannot see who the customer was, but I've seen this, and not just one of them, but 4,000 of these. And I can promise you, even though you can read the test, uh, when you have 4,000 of these, you're not able to maintain it. And what you see happening here is that the original intention of Dan North when he created BDD is lost here, because we're no longer doing a uh, high-level scenario, but we're now going too, way too low into the details. So that should be captured uh, in uh, actions, for example, so that you don't have to go this low level. And uh, I talked to Dan North in Star East, so we, we looked at this stuff, and uh, we, we, we see the same things in our projects, that uh, when people go from just test design to automation, they become too detailed, and the tests become poor and detailed and difficult to maintain. So even though the test might be good, it's not good for automation. 
an automation engineer will not have any problems automating this, but will have a lot of problems maintaining that automation. At the request of a participant in Star East, I created something which is still very tentative, which I call, uh, which are anti-patterns. And some of you, especially those in development, might be familiar with uh, patterns. And patterns are a very effective way to do a good system development. Uh, there are also test patterns around, although they are less used than development patterns. But also very popular are what they call anti-patterns, like uh, analysis paralysis or um, uh, stuff like that. Now, what you need to do with an anti-pattern, you need to give it a description. You also give, need to give it a name. So, uh, I'm, I'm uh, currently working on this list. One, if any of you has an idea for me about any of these names or maybe another anti-pattern, uh, send me an email. I would be very grateful. So, this is what I have so far. Not having many business tests, I see that as a problem. So, when you look at your tests and at your test cases, and you see it's only interaction test, I would be, uh, I would urge you to take another look because it will be very difficult to maintain the test, might not be very de deep, might be shallow, so interaction heavy. Or lame means there is no variety, no depth in the test. You do not try to break the system under test. You're not using any testing techniques like decision tables or uh, state diagrams or anything like that. Another one, uh, which is my favorite, enter, enter, click, click. In other words, test steps are way too diff uh, detailed. Every single click is in your test case. So you really should start to create some actions or if you're just in a scripting language to uh, subroutines, uh, but try to get rid of all these details. Now let's see, uh, no life, uh, there is no life cycle. So, uh, I see you work with cars, but I don't see how you define a new car. So that's a question. Hey, where is the, the life cycle? Or when the tests do, do not have any clear scope. We saw that example earlier. You just don't know when you look at the test, what's the, what's the purpose of this test? And when you have a lot of interaction in the business test. And so uh, you log in with a high level, you rent the car, and then you suddenly check a window title or something like that. A very important one, probably the most important one in this list, is overchecking. Too many checks. And that typically happens when you use a test management tool like uh, Quality Center or uh, MTM or any other one uh, as your starting point. And in that test management tool, when you have a test case, there will be a screen which is called Steps in which you can create a number of steps. That, that screen has a number of columns, and one of the columns says expected, expected outcome or something like that. And if you populate those cells, what the automation engineer is going to do, he's going to automate every single check, meaning you get way too many checks, meaning your statistics are skewed, and you get many more passes than you're entitled to, but also it makes it very maintenance sensitive. Because if any of these things that you check uh, get wrong, then uh, you have to go for all your tests to change it. And last one, sneaky checking. I also hate that uh, when, when you're checking things and I cannot see that you're checking them. And when I step into the room and look at your test, you should be able to just show me the test module and it should take me mo no more than 10 seconds. I call it the 10 second rule. It should take me no more than 10 seconds to understand what you're checking. Okay, with that, let's take a look at those actions. And this slide kind of summarizes how you choose your actions. Obviously, the scope of the test module defines what kind of actions you should use, whether they should be low level or high level. And what you, the rule is you try to be as high level as appropriate. So that's not the same as as high level as possible. It really depends on your scope but use as little arguments as possible. So be uh, generous with default. Uh, we'll have a slide for that coming up. Be clear in the names. What I have seen work in almost all tests I've seen is just use a verb and a noun. So like 
check balance, enter customer, delete order, stuff like that. What you then also do is standardize those. So you say delete order, you do not say remove order or the other way around. So as a team and as an organization, if you can agree on the verbs and on the nouns, then the chance when you have two different people needing the same action that they actually find out that the action already exists is much higher. And then be very careful, especially if you're a developer or you have done been a developer in the past, that you don't make it too technical. So tests are meant to be read, read especially business tests, for uh, everybody, including non-technical people. So they're not source code. So don't use uh, glued, camel case, uppercase, underlines. Uh, in other words, you, you might, might hardly read it. No hard to understand team names, please. And you can see that no hard to understand is hard to understand. Make sure to manage the actions, make sure to document the actions. It is your, uh, uh, your, your, your core deliverable that you should, to, should take very seriously. Make sure to test them very well. Also make sure that it is the testers who define the actions. So don't have an action committee define the actions for everybody else. Uh, but make sure that the team or the, the, the testers in the team uh, have some leeway to define actions. Here are some examples. I might have a test in which I click a tree item. This again is based on a real customer and it has a path. And then in the project I look at the tasks and there should be a task called plan of approach. So this is a workflow system. Now, if you're testing the UI, if you're testing the interaction, might be a good test. However, if you just want to know whether a task is in a project, you don't, do not do it this way. Because even the path is detailed here, and that path might change. So, uh, and when the path changes, you have to maintain that test. So, not a good idea. So, better just say check task and project. And then, uh, when you have a check like this, you could even do it with a uh, SQL database query. You might not even have to go through that UI. However, don't make the opposite mistake that you show too little details. Like in this case, this appears to be an action that uh, checks a user ID and a password, but from the action you cannot see what it is actually checking. Whether it's too short or too long, or has numbers or no numbers, you can't see it, and that's uh, too bad. Now, from an automation perspective, uh, this is also an important uh, thing to look at. Uh, even within the actions, you can do a leveling. So obviously there is a low level, as we usually call it the system level, where you really talk to the UI or any other interface like an API or uh, a service, a web service or anything like that, eh? REST, SOAP, the whole stuff. Uh, very generic and you will see the same click uh, in, in very different projects. High level is more focused on the business, so it really talks about enter a customer, rent a car, it does not show you any details, hopefully. But then in the middle, it's good to have another level of actions, which I like to call mid-level actions. And uh, they're usually quite ugly, but they're very useful. So they uh, may wrap a form or a dialogue or a web page, and uh, maybe a bit like a page object, something like that. And it, uh, it allows you to enter all the fields in that particular page object or in that particular uh, page. And like enter all the address fields. And that action will take care of the enter, enter, click, click stuff. Meaning if there is a change in that field, you only have to change that single action. And then those mid-level actions are combined together to form your business level. And here is a slide that, uh, encouraging you to use default values. And when, by the way, if you want the slides, uh, you, you can have them. Uh, let me know. Uh, I will send them to you or we'll put them somewhere. Uh, and then you can use them when you want to talk to people. You can use them yourself. So here you see that uh, in the bottom left, I'm really uh, using the arguments, user and password, while in the bottom right, I'm just using the default values. 
tester and tester PW, whatever it is, because in the bottom right, I'm only interested in making a payment. I don't care what the login ID is. In the bottom left, I really want to check the login. So here I do Tamara, uh, Tamara J as a password, and then I want to see hello Tamara. Okay, now let's look at organization. And we're almost at the end of our uh, webinar. Um, how do you organize this? Uh, first of all, let's look at developers. Uh, developers can help a lot in uh, g giving you the handles to do good test design and to do good automation. Uh, if an org is a system and the test is well organized, it has clear components, it has clear tiers, it has good services, uh, like microservices or anything like that, it will be much easier to test. What also developers can do and what I think they should do is provide you white, what I call white box access. So any hidden values, uh, like, let's take a game with monsters that you need to shoot at, something I really like to do. But then when you want to test a game like that, you really don't not want to go through the imaging. You really want to just know from the system and the test where is the monster so that you can uh, shoot. And that also means that shooting, or in this case teleporting to another level in the game, should be, uh, there should be a hook for that. Uh, or very important timing so that you, if a table is populating or a file is being produced, that you have a criterion to know when it's done. That you do not have to do that yourself in the automation because I promise you that's a lot more work. And then the other bullet point is important. Uh, if you have a UI, uh, then that UI is full with UI elements, uh, like controls on a uh, dialog or HTML elements on a web page. You need ways to identify those. If you have to do that yourself with a spy tool and a viewer, uh, that is a lot of work. If your developers just give you a QA ID property or they just populate the name property or the ID attribute uh, in a web page, if they do that for you, then your automation is going to be a lot quicker and is a lot less sensitive for changes. You, 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 you eliminate an entire realm of automation complications. And needless to say, before I go further, needless to say that an uh, agile team is an ideal environment for that. Because developers, testers, automation engineers are all in the same room, or at least in the same team. Here you see that uh, this technique with actions is not just for UI testing. It's also about protocols, APIs, UI, database, all of that command line, uh, mainframe, uh, batch uh, screen scraping, batch files, all that. And what you can do is put that all in the same test module. We see a lot of tests actually go between UI and under the UI. This is a picture that I like to use for, uh, for Agile. And it shows you how you can fit the testing into Agile. And the most important thing is that you try uh, at the end of the sprint when you're done and done is a status in uh, Scrum, when you're done, you want the test to be finished and you want the test to be automated, preferably for all the environments that uh, the, the application needs to work on. Now you can do that if you follow a very strict cadence. That means you start with your test module development at a higher level, at the same level as your user stories and your work items and your acceptance criteria, etc. Then down the line in the sprint, you uh, identify your interface uh, definitions, uh, interface mapping with the developers with defined properties. So uh, one of the rules that we use internally is you're not allowed to use the spy tool. You must do it by hand. By doing that, you force yourself to use identifying properties. When you do that, the automation is going to be a lot more speedier, uh, speedy and then you can start executing and make additional interactive test modules when more of the details of your interaction become available. Now by doing that, you can achieve a high reuse down the line. After your sprint, you can reuse the test and you can reuse your automation. 
and we, we get a lot of our services business from teams who cannot keep up uh, even with these uh, principles and that we are like the overflow because what do you want to do? You want to make sure that the QA in your team is in the same sprint as the developer is. So you do not want automate tests from a previous sprint. That's something you want to avoid at all costs. Okay, that brings me to the closing of this uh, webinar. I hope you liked it. Uh, many of you are still here, so that uh, that's a good sign. Uh, this is the, here are some summary uh, points. Uh, uh, most of all, automated testing should not be treated as automating manual testing. You really should do a uh, test design uh, that is also friendly to automation. <coughs> so domain language approaches can help, but there are no silver bullet. You need to do that test design at my various level. And then we talked about how to uh, developers can help, which can also help a lot in your testing efficiency. And then uh, we have uh, talked about Agile a little bit. I have actually written about that, so you might want to look that up. Uh, it is uh, Agile is a wonderful environment for good uh, automated testing. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it uh, useful. Uh, and with that, uh, Joe, I give it back to you.